Okay, I guess we can get started, right? It's half past six. Um, hi and welcome to all the people out there all over the planet. And it's not even an exaggeration, that's great. Um, to our online event, Women in Crises. My name is Ellie and I'm the president of Initiativgruppe Altbach Wien, IG Vienna in short, who is hosting this event. Um, because I'm sure many of you heard that also the different Altbach clubs are hosting events um, and streaming as part of the official forum program. And that's what this event is. And it is really my great honor to be moderating this panel of outstanding experts on the topic. First, I'll give you a bit of context what our event is about and cannot wait to hear the diverse takes on the crises from our experts. Women really are at the forefront of the COVID-19 crisis. In the health sector, over 75% of the workforce is female. Service sectors such as tourism and the hospitality industry, which were more severely affected by this crisis than others, also have high female employment rates. However, not only in the labor market are women put under additional strain, they also continue to carry out most of the unpaid work within households, even more so during the COVID-19 pandemic. Closures of schools and childcare facilities massively increase pressure on families, often, again, shouldered by women. This crisis continues to bring structures of inequality into the limelight and shows once more that in order to have a long-lasting impact on equality, policy measures must take gender issues into account. We want to discuss the role of women in crises, plural, with experts from different fields, health, politics, economics, and human rights. Which is why it is now really my great pleasure to welcome our distinguished guests to this online stage. Welcome, first of all, to Dr. Katharina Mader. Maybe you can wave so everybody knows who you are. Great. Uh, from the Department of Economy, Economy at the University of Economics in Vienna. Katharina specializes in heterodox economics, has published widely in the field of feminist economics, and in her research has focused on gender budgeting and the gender wealth gap, more generally speaking. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule and sharing your recent research on the COVID-19 crisis and its effects on women with us. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Welcome, second of all, to Dr. Mireille Ngosso. Can you also wave? Hello. Who is not only a medical doctor, but also a social democrat politician, activist and mother. At three years old in 1980, she fled with her family from what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo to Austria. I'm beyond grateful, really, that she's taking the time out of busily campaigning for the Viennese City Council elections and that she'll be talking to us about her really diverse experiences as a doctor, politician and frontline Black Lives Matter activist during the COVID-19 crisis in Vienna. Hello. Hello. Thank you. And welcome. Last but definitely not least to Monika Fröhler, who is the CEO of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens in Vienna. She's not only a passionate change maker, advocate, founder and speaker, but has international experience from working at the UN in Geneva, New York and Vienna, the EU and the Austrian Ministry in the Austrian Foreign Ministry. As she is as passionate about the implementation of the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement, as well, about, as, well as about gender equality, we are really beyond excited to hear what her take on the current multifocal crisis and, as we said in the chat, potential ways out of it might be. Thank you so much. Welcome. Okay, so how will we proceed in this session? We will now hear three 10 to 15 minute expert statements by our speakers. And afterwards, we will take questions from the audience, which you can post in the session chat on the right. They are really more than welcome and explicitly encouraged. But for now, really enough from me. Katarina, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And um, I'm gonna use my 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, um, to show you a bit of our results on a very recent study um, on the um, on the effects, or whether this uh, pandemic had any effect on the distribution of unpaid work within households. And when I'm talking about um, unpaid work, um, I refer to uh, childcare and housework. So that's the work that is done within the household. And I brought a few slides so that I that you can follow me a bit more easy, I guess. And I'm trying to share my screen now, just to 
well that's working so i hope you can see uh my slides now may i ask as a moderator is that working for everyone can you yeah. see um, the share yeah. screen because actually i don't see you yes. <laughs> anymore okay. i guess so. that's normal but we said i'll uh, get in touch once you uh, maybe do a sound signal um so you know i'll just say five minutes left and then you're good okay great but as i see in the chat it's working Great. Perfect, perfect. So um, you, you can see with the title that our research um, is focused on the question of what does um, or what did home office arrangements um, do to the dis distribution of unpaid work within households. And um, why did we why did we start this research? Um, um, it was at the very beginning of this pandemic that we had the voice, especially from economics or economists, really, um, that stated that this this crisis can decrease gender inequalities in unpaid work because now men are at home, now men do see what amount of unpaid work is necessary in a household to function, and thus they will um, take on a larger a larger share of this unpaid work now within this pandemic, but also in the future. And there is another strand of research and researchers that state that um, that's wishful thinking, <laughs> that um, the possibility or, or the possibility alone of working from home does not um, change anything, um, does, not, um, that does not bring more men into housework, but also, but, but also reinforces existing um, role models and will lead to more and multiple burdens for women. And either of them has potential long-term consequences because what is now implemented might affect us within the next 10 years. So that's why we started this um, research. And what we've done is we um, developed a, an online survey um, for Austria. So that's, that's, um, <laughs> that's necessary to say. I don't, we all, all only did that research in Austria. And we asked people to tell us about their time use, about um, the division of their housework, their childcare, how sat satisfied they are with this um, division, and also how um, home, work, home office arrangement do work or why they don't work. And we did that. Um, between the end of April to um, mid-May, which was the strict um, um, lockdown in Austria. And um, we had more than 2,100 people completely filling out this survey, um, where you can see that it's mostly women, um, lots of urban women, uh, um, 40, uh, sorry, 50, 54% from Vienna, and also that much um, aged uh, 30 to 49. 75% um, are living in couples households and 41% do have children under 15. And the important thing is that um, more than two, uh, two thirds of them were working from home, 18% um, were partially working from home and the uh, two thirds were completely working from home. And that is connected to the um, 65% um, university graduates, because um, we see in all of the studies that we have, not, not only from Austria, but especially from Austria, that there is a connection between high and higher um, education and high and higher earnings, uh, high and higher income, and the possibility to working from home during a pandemic like that. Um, whereas the ones with um, lower education and lower income um, are at the forefront of um, working at supermarkets, at, um, as you know. Um, so um, that is not a representative sample of the Austrian population that I have to say, but it can build a picture of middle class women, um, urban middle class women affected by this crisis. Um, and so um, to show you a few of the results that we get so far is one is that this <laughs> slide where you can see um, the division of paid and unpaid hours worked. And um, I'll guide you to this one here. Um, that's the single parents. And actually we got about five or six um, male 
single fathers, but mostly it's single mothers, to be honest. Um, and it's not surprising that single mothers were working post time. They had 15 hours a day and of that about nine hours unpaid work to do. Um, that is that is something that we've seen from from crisis before and that's something that we see from time use studies all over the world but what was very surprising to us is the mothers in couples households with children under 15 that did not um well it, it wasn't it wasn't that they were um so different to single mothers than we were expecting it they were working um 14 and, 14 and a half hours total and nine and a half hours unpaid. And what you can see here is the difference between mothers and fathers in those um, couple households. And you can see a time difference in unpaid work, um, which was about two and a half to three hours. And you can see that it was not that men or fathers did not do any uh, unpaid work. They did quite a large share, but nowhere near equally um, distributed. Um, you can see that the difference is still still there when both are working from home. It's, just, it's a bit better, but still there. And you can see that there's no difference or almost no difference at all when you're looking at um, couples where both were working full time, because here you've got all the couples that don't have children. So um, having children, especially in Austria, does a lot to um, how you <laughs> um, how you share um, paid and unpaid work. And usually you have a picture like this, where um, women work part time and men work full time. So um, women usually use a lot more time on unpaid work than men do. And to show you a little bit more about how children affect um, or did affect um, um, hours worked um, during this pandemic, I got this slide, um, which focuses on time use by um, the child's or children's um, age and um, states, really states um, the um, youngest child's age. And what you can see here is not surprising. Most countries, <laughs> you can you can have a picture like that, where a father's um, working time, paid working time, is not affected at all by having children or by the age of their children. So that's about the same for all age groups here. You can here with the uh, two-year-olds, with the three to five-year-olds, and so on. You can you can see here as well that women's mothers um, paid work is very much affected by the age of their youngest child. So women mothers um, with children up to two are about, are, work, are working about three hours um, per day paid, and um, mothers with uh, children over fifteen um, have about the same um, working time paid working time as fathers. What you can also see here is that the amount of housework is not really affected by the age of um, children, neither for mothers nor for fathers, it kind of stays the same. So the amount of um, cooking, um, cleaning, um, washing, um, washing clothes is not really affected by the age of the children, but as you can see here, uh, child care time is very much affected. And usually we get this declining um, picture that you can see here. But usually um, we see a steep decline, really. So it's a lot of time for care, uh, for child care when the child is very young and it's deeply um, declining, um, which didn't decline that much within this crisis, especially not with the primary school kids. So you can see here the amount of homeschooling that was done early by women and the difference that um, fathers and mothers would um, uh, use on, on childcare, homeschooling really. And um, another fun fact that... Left. Okay. Sorry? If we are very strict, you would have five minutes left, okay? Just okay, I, I can do that. <laughs> 
fun fact, which is not really funny, is uh, when you see the like blue up there. That's the free time, the leisure time, and um, it is it is not increasing for women, for mothers, um, until <laughs> their child is about is is more than 14 years old. But then it doesn't even reach the amount that fathers have. So not really funny, but fun fact. Um, so that's the thing on, or that's the, the results that I can show you in that short time uh, on, um, on the time use. What we did ask people was um, how was or how is the distribution of this unpaid work? And we asked women, um, compared to your partner, who is doing the majority of housework, who's doing the majority of childcare, and who is doing it now within the pandemic, and what was it like before? And 57% um, of the women said that they were doing the majority of housework, and even 71% said that they were doing the majority of childcare. However, most of these women said that they did that before as well. So um, they had another um, or a, a lower overall hourly level, but they still were responsible for um, the majority of housework and childcare. So this pandemic does not change gender specific norms uh, on who is responsible for unpaid work. Um, it, it makes them visible at least. And um, that's, that's that's my outlook my, my my trying to conclude um that there is um not surprisingly but not not very good news um just like we've seen with the past um crisis especially the one um uh from 2008 2009 but also crisis before um this crisis has no potential whatsoever to automatically become an instrument of gender equality um what we do see is, or what we do realize for the first time, I guess, is that uh, when schools and kindergartens, and especially grandparents, grandparents are um, really, really, really important in Austria, um, are no longer available, um, we realize how, what, what networks of underpaid, but also unpaid work is actually necessary for childcare, um, and we might get to, to formulate a political, um, a political statement with that. What we also did, and that's what I'm gonna, gonna just take a glimpse on and just finish with here as well, is we tried to find out about the mental health of people at that moment of um, lockdown, and we see an extreme stress for women, which is evident in all of the dimensions that we can we can ask them about uh, of, of their mental health, because they stated in in way more often than men that all of their symptoms had worsened during um, this pandemic and especially worrying from our perspective is the proportion of single mothers who reported a worsening of their um, state of health between um, um, between 42 to 36 uh, percent when you look at the different dimensions which is really worrying and um, lets us um, <laughs> well let us think about um, what, what women had to do um, during this time and what uh, what they are expecting or what they what they fear of now that uh, autumn is approaching and um, schools and kindergartens should be open again and with no idea how <laughs> how it will work out so um, that's my very short overview of our study um, thank you so much for listening and um, I'll kind of try to close that now Wait. which worked out perfectly exactly. i'm here so again That's cool. <laughs> great job thank you thank you so much also for sticking to the time limit like uh, the pro you are thank you so much very very perfect um i would now hand over to Mireille, if that's okay with you and we are really excited to hear your take um, on the crisis from the fields of medicine and politics slash activism. Okay. Everybody can hear me? Okay. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, an, I'm really, really delighted to be here and to share my experiences here at this panel. Uh, it's my first time actually at the Forum Alpbach and although it's held online, it is an honor for me to speak at this event. Uh, you already, um, Elisabeth, uh, you already introduced myself. 
um, but uh, I would like uh, to say a little bit more. As my name is Meren Gusso, I'm a doctor and a politician here in Austria and Vienna. And I was born in the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. And by the age of three, I came to Vienna with my parents because my parents had to flee the country. And today's topic, women in crisis, um, let me tell you, my mother, my sisters, and I experienced a lot of crisis growing, growing up. And when my parents were divorcing, we had to go to a women's shelter in the middle of the night. Or when I dropped out of school, I had to work plenty precarious and underpaid jobs to make ends meet. Uh, and as a working mom, I know that it's everything but easy to raise a child when you're working full time. I know what I'm talking about. Um, I will, today we talk about how the global pandemic affects women's life. And I must say that women in the West, especially here in Austria, are in better position uh, compared to women in the global South. Uh, when I talk to my friends, especially to women in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I get the feeling that people, and especially women, are more fearful for their livelihoods and, uh, than afraid to get infected by the coronavirus. And it is especially women who has usually earned money by se selling food or craft work uh, on the streets. And already in normal times, it's, it is hard for them to get by with the little money they make. And during the lockdown, these women are completely deprived of their livelihood. And in a crisis like that, there's also no help from state institutions or other social institutions. Um, when talking about how the crisis affects women, we therefore should not overlook that in other countries, women suffer way worse than here in Europe or in Austria. Nevertheless, today I would like to talk also about uh, the crisis affected, affects women here in Austria. Austria has one of the best social systems in the world. We still got uh, affordable health care. We got a good uh, pension system. Our unemployment benefits are not too bad and women receive at least a year of maternity leave. All in all, our system is designed to compensate for unexpected life events or difficult situations. We have to be grateful for the systems and preserve it and also try to get better than we have it right now. However, we, will, we still experience structural uh, differences between men and women. The crisis showed us that during the Austrian lockdown, it is, um, it is the tremendous effort of women which kept our society and our life running. For example, more than two, um, two thirds of the people uh, employed in the food retail sector are women. And even more staggering in the percentage of women in so social care services, such as elderly care or child care. 88% of care workers are women, but it, it is this work which is highly underpaid and under -evaluate. I cannot imagine what would have been, what would have happened without the work of women during the crisis. But it's also the women which have double or even triple burden, they are still mainly the ones which have children or elderly family members and they do the part of the housework at home. This is a balancing act for women. Studies show that women suffer more from the crisis than men. 51% of the women say that the current crisis is very stressful for them, while only 40% of the men report the same. And I saw it also in the hospital. A lot of women who came in the night with the, um, in the night because they had uh, didn't feel so well or or um, had pain. It was mainly because of the crisis of Corona. It was because they were they were stressed stressed out with their life how everything would continue for them yeah a lot of them were very very lonely they couldn't see their their children because they were um yeah for the effect of um, of the coronavirus um sadly also the number of domestic violence against women increased during during the pandemic finally 85 percent of the people who became unemployed during this crisis in austria were women and this is another confirm confirmation that it is women who mainly work precarious and unsecure jobs. And during the time, I was really, really feeling sad. 
um, when I was thinking of the women and also the children who were forced to stay at home and who were forced to stay at home in in a violent um, environment. Yeah. And we got a lot of calls of women for seeking for help because they didn't know how to get out of the situation. We can see there is a big gap between men and women. It is responsibility of politic leaders to once and for all change this in inequality between men and women. So what, what can we do about that? First, it is of utmost importance to value the work of, you, of women financially. It's, it is not enough to just clap once a day <laughs> that the women are doing all this work. Um, it is important that we, we show this value financially. We need to make sure that those jobs who kept our system running are paid better. Yeah? Uh, you have to imagine that, um, um, I'm so sorry, my English is not so good, um, but you have to imagine that uh, um, a plague as a nurse in the, in the hospital yeah, earns so, so approximately um, 1,500 euro. And it's not enough for that kind of job that she's doing. She's washing the patient. She's all the time with the patient. Yeah? We, the doctors, we just do our rounds and that's it, yeah? But the person who actually stays with the patients are the nurses. And this is a, a job that we really have to, to pay well, yeah? And I can really only insist on that. Um, we, as on, uh, yeah, and we also, moreover, moreover, we need to make sure that those working in social or healthcare get better working conditions. They're working sometimes 12 hours a day. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pulling up very heavily uh, patients. They need better working conditions because after a short time, after three, okay, let me say 10 years, most of them are tired and stop the job. And we really need to uh, get better working condition and financially a better situations uh, for in the social or healthcare. As a doctor and a mother, I know the struggle. It is hard to work sometimes uh, 25 hour shifts. And when you have to take uh, in the morning your child to the kindergarten, then you work 25 hours, uh, you, get, you come home, you sleep for two hours, then you have to pick up your child and stay with your child and you are really tired, yeah? Um, we have to make sure that, that uh, working hours for women in these sectors are better compatible with work and family duties. It cannot be that in our time that um, my professor is telling me that um, when you have, you cannot take care of your child, then this is not my problem. Then you have to look for another, um, another, an, another job, yeah? Because I'm a surgeon, I'm, I'm operating um, patients. And he tells me I have to be there even after my hours, yeah, to, to learn properly uh, my job. But this is not the way we can, we can continue. Because in the end, it, would, it means that only men can work there and no women, yeah? And this cannot be it. Um, uh, so we have really to make sure that working hours with women in these sectors are better compatible with work and family duties. Otherwise, mothers are forced into working part-time, yeah? Which affects not only their current salary, but also their pen pen um, pensions. Okay. And finally, we have to acknowledge that those underpaid and undervalued jobs are often done by migrant, as a migrant, as a migrant women, yeah? We must stop looking down on them and finally treat them equally. They deserve the same social protection. They deserve the same rights to vote and participate in our society. And they deserve to be treated with respect. And this is really, really important because these are the women who, under this crisis, who, who, were, who, who were there for us. Um, finally, I have to say that I'm very grateful for what my home city Vienna is doing. Since uh, 2009, all children from the age of uh, one or even less are eligible for a place in the uh, in the kindergarten, and parents uh, do not have to pay for the childcare. As well, I, 
my child is going to um, to a kindergarten, and we pay only sixty euro, and it's open from six until uh, uh, five thirty. Yeah, it's really perfect. Yeah. This is a re re huge uh, relief for working moms as uh, uh, financial restraints and are reduced and their ability to work full time is enhanced. Yeah? And also during school holidays, non contemporary summer camps organized by the city are helping women with the care of the child during the long, uh, long summer break. Moreover, there are four. Um, and soon five women's shelter taking care of women and their children, which are victims of uh, domestic violence. And uh, I, I lived with my mother in, uh, in, uh, in, in a women's shelter for over a year. And I can tell you, it really, it really helps our life. Yeah. Um, I don't think that we, I would have been here where I'm now if we, if it wasn't also for the women's shelter. Yeah. It really helped us and especially my mom. Um, as I've myself stayed in one of those shelters for a while and I know how important it is for every woman to have the opportunity and access to a safe environment in times of crisis and violence. Also, public housing for single parents is extended, which is a huge relief for single mothers. And finally, there are special training programs with, uh, which uh, support women in their professional de de development. All in all, it is those uh, concrete uh, projects which really helps to close the inequality gap between men and women. And if we really want equality, we need concrete actions uh, and we need also the, um, to be voluntary and really wanting to change something. Yeah, not only saying it, but really taking the steps that we have we can stop as well the inequality gap between men and women. Um, and we need them from the public sector. We cannot rely on the private sector when it comes to implementing uh, equality. The corona crisis won't be the last crisis. We have to deal with many more, I'm sure. Yeah. And as soon as we start improving work and life conditions for women everywhere, we have an advantage when taking the next crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mireille. Um, because there is a little bit of time left, like almost three minutes, would you mind asking, like the Whoa. way you describe your uh, working hours, how did you manage to organize a Black Lives Matter demonstration that had a turnout of 50,000 people during uh, the whole COVID crisis? First of all, where um, do you take your heavenly energies from? And second of all, <laughs> how did you do it? How did you go about it? Um, I really have to say that I'm really blessed that I have my mother and I have my brothers and my sisters who really, really help me every week. We, we look at my plan. How is my, my working mm -hmm. plan? And then we manage together how we, uh, who can take care of Samuel and who can stay with Samuel. I'm really blessed. I know that I know that not everybody has it. And if I wouldn't have my family, I couldn't do that. Uh, what I'm doing now. And um, as for the Black Lives Matter um, uh, demonstration, it was really, um, <laughs> I didn't even think that 50,000 people would come. Yeah. Uh, uh, we were thinking like, okay, maybe 500 people and that's oh. it. Yeah. And then it were there were 50,000 people. And I'm really, really proud of Austria uh, because overall there were like 80,000 people who demonstrated in Austria. Um, and it's really a huge sign that we are going in the in the right direction, and it really makes me feel uh, proud that as a black person, um, there are so many people who who are who are in the same boat with us and who are fighting with us. Thank you so much for all your work. We can really only stand in solidarity with you. Thank you. Thanks for your contribution. Thank you very much. And Thank please you. don't worry about your English. It was perfect, really. Thank you. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so now I'll hand over uh, to Monika Fröda. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Eli, and thanks for Mireille and for Katharina for your very insightful speeches. 
we are doing it actually the reverse order because I want to take the step back and zoom out. You were zooming very much on Austria, but I would like to give a shout out to Tanzania, Taiwan, Brazil, Ecuador, Nigeria, Bolivia, Zimbabwe, Taipei, Egypt, Ghana, Germany, South Africa, India, and Austria. These were the notes that I took from your chat. It's amazing that all of you are gathering for this. So thanks so much for tuning in. Now, women in crisis is a broad topic, and I want to tackle it in three installments. My first will be about women leadership, female leadership in the crisis. My second one will be about what has aggravated, and we have heard a lot, for women within the crisis. But the third part, which is probably the most important, is what is the opportunity in it? So how are women the pieces for the solutions? And mind you, we are. So when it comes to female leadership, um, probably many of you have read the Forbes article about female leaders, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, excelling. Um, yet, uh, a question to you would be, and maybe you can give me in the chat some of your answers, how much of, so how many people of humanity are currently governed by women? So how many percent of humankind is currently governed by women? And maybe you know, well, you're typing hopefully a percentage, maybe 20 I see here, maybe 0 0.5, 10, 15, so it varies quite a bit. We have 7.7 .7 billion people on this planet currently. So how many of them are governed by women? And ladies and gentlemen who are listening, brace yourself, only 7% of humankind are currently governed by women, which leaves 93% to um, our, uh, to the other half yet half of the world is female and half of the world is below the age of 29 so we are actually not quite well represented when it comes to the policy level nevertheless those of you who read the forbes article will see that particularly countries like norway iceland finland germany taiwan have done really well denmark tackling the crisis and all of them have in common they are led by women. I'm not saying that men are, are not as good as women. They're like the, from the death rate comparison, and there are great articles about that as well. Women don't necessarily perform better when it comes to just calculating on the basis of death per million. But where women outperform men is in the collaborative approach. And some of the examples that were given there was, for example, Iceland, immediately Jan Jakobsdottir, Katrin, was introducing immediately tests for everyone. Um, Sana Marin in Finland was actually locking the country down, but in a, in a cautious manner, so, so fast that Finland is very well off when it comes to the crisis. Uh, Angela Merkel, soon after the Danish um, prime minister was giving a press conference for children, Angela Merkel was also giving a press conference for children that really helped to sensitize the, the children and make them conscious of their contribution. Um, you had uh, Jacinda Atern in New Zealand, who, although she had just put down the baby, she is a, a, a mom of, of a small one, and she had just put down the baby to sleep, but she talked to the country in a very empathetic way, saying, we have a crisis here, and only with five people sick in New Zealand, she also uh, really implemented an incredible lockdown. Um, Taiwan, similarly, like great testing immediately and measures by, by the prime minister of Taiwan. So we have examples from across the globe where women really excelled at this. So women in leadership, I'm not saying that they are necessarily doing everything better, but I do say 93% of the, of the world still being only governed by men. I think it's up to our generation to change this. So let's take the opportunity. However, and now I come to the second point, the situation of women aggravated within the crisis. And here we are talking before the crisis, we already had a very uneven kind of situation for women. We are talking child marriage, in Asia, uh, sometimes even still occurring in Africa. We have female genital mutilation. Millions of ladies are affected by that. We are talking um, unequal pay, even in Europe. Uh, we are talking domestic violence, violence, sexual violence, violence as a weapon of war. So we are really talking about massive problems lacking of access to education, lack of property rights, and that my list goes on and on and on and on. But like on top of that, on top of that sort of base level of complexity, 
we have the crisis. And the crisis, obviously, if we are looking at statistics from what happened at the Ebola crisis or SARS or MERS or other crises that were often regional, Africa knows a lot about the Ebola crisis, but the statistics that came from there actually said that women were particularly disadvantaged. Why? Let me give you some examples. Some of the healthcare, if it was existent, focused on the emergency response. So maternal health, child health, and even like giving birth in a sort of um, healthy environment was impossible, which led to many more deaths in this regard. Violence at home increased everywhere. In every pandemic, you have domestic violence increasing tremendously. Stats now for COVID show that in US, Canada, Germany, you name it, in the, in the Western countries that have these statistics, the increase is up to 25%. Um, many countries don't have the statistic. Another factor is that teenage pregnancies skyrocketed during times of pandemic. We know that from SARS, Ebola, MERS, etc. We do know that uh, more women die, died in childbirth and that the financial challenges were unevenly worse for ladies because they lost the jobs. They lost employment often because they needed to take care of someone in their households. So, as I said, on top of the base level complexities, we added another level of complexity. And yet, let me turn to the positive end of things, because women indeed are a solution to a lot of it. Not only are we half of the globe, which is already quite a force to reckon with, but too, if you're looking at the, at the overall list of challenges, we too are the solution. And if you switch on an entrepreneurial mindset, I know that the bigger the challenge, the greater the opportunity. Every entrepreneur sees a challenge within his or her community finds a solution and sells it to the people. And I think we women have to get more of that kind of mindset. We see a challenge and we should roll up our sleeves and tackle it. We won't be able to do it alone. We need the other half, definitely. But nevertheless, we can do the first major steps. So what am I talking about? Climate change, maybe some of you don't yet know that the number one solution to climate change is girls' education and reproductive rights. And you might wonder, Monica, why are you talking about solar panels and renewable energy and energy efficiency and energy access? Yes, it's all part of the solution. But the primary, the one, uh, like it's not a silver bullet, but one of the most important methods to tackle climate change is girls' education and reproductive health. Why? Because our population is still exploding. And only if you give education to girls of a young age, they will make the right decisions of staying in school longer, uh, educate themselves to get the jobs that they need to actually sustain themselves and hopefully not like a, a like an armada of children, but those that can really be supported. So that's the first point. When it comes to the economic downturn, again, the solution definitely with the build up of the economies lies with women. But I want to motion what Mireille said, that much of the work that women do, the caretaker work, is not compensated. It is not uh, reimbursed. And yet it is work that is absolutely essential. So I plead to all of those of you out there who are decision makers, change makers, policy makers, we need to get to a state where women's caretaking work is appreciated by society so much that it's reimbursed in a fair way. And that goes to the teachers, to the nurses, to, the, to, to all of the elderly people caretakers. And it is the policy that needs to define how to level this, this for now, discrepancy. Um, for a dollar that a woman earns, she reinvests into society and community 90 cents. For a dollar a man earns, Statistics say he only reinvests about 60 cents into community. So we know where money is actually better spent on a global scale. And two, we also know that for a dollar that a man earns, a woman only gets 80 cents for now, which is something that we need to even up. When it comes to conflict, peace and conflict, um, women make conflict resolutions last longer and better. And maybe some of you don't know, but very few peace agreements are signed by women, yet they carry the brunt of the burden. So involving uh, ladies not only in crisis response, which is not happening so much, but also in conflict prevention and conflict uh, resolution is of the essence. Um, conflicts that are solved with the participation of women last 
15 years longer than if no women are included at all, which already should give us an incentive to, to involve women more and more. When it comes to digitalization, obviously we are still talking about major hurdles that women are not as digital as men. Much of it is access, but sometimes it's even also simply the skills. Now, those of you who are interested, the Gates Foundation, for example, has a whole program of women becoming financially uh, um, financially more independent by being able to access mobile financial services. The moment you give a woman an account, she can save money and she can build her own business. In many countries, it's not possible even to have property rights, to have your identification card, let alone an account, an account on which you can take a loan, on which you can acquire property. So there are fortunately systems out there, but they are definitely not yet enough. Domestic violence, yes, a massive challenge, and yet women tend to, to be secretive about it. I think the more outspoken we are about it and the more we get a network of helpers around us, most, mostly feminine helpers, female helpers, the more we can actually work together on stopping uh, violence against women. Those of you who want to become activists, check out Orange the World, the campaign of UN Women. They are doing an incredible job every year. One out of three women is affected by physical or sexual violence, independent of the COVID crisis. And Orange the World is the campaign to make, to raise awareness of this. So many points where women can lead the solutions and where leaders, women leaders have actually uh, already showcased that. And I think my time is up, but giving you, um, it, it's still okay, I still have three minutes. That's absolutely brilliant. So what we have explored is women leaders not necessarily are generally the better leaders, but they devise tools and methods and systems that are actually helpful. In your comments that I, that I spotted on the side, you said education would help. I motioned that, absolutely. Girls' education and reproductive rights should be a top, top priority for all of us. Um, domestic violence increasing also with mental trauma that is connected to it. It is fantastic that in countries like Austria, we do have um, efforts that are supporting this. I know that in many continents it's not yet the case. So if you are one of these activists that, that has time at hand, start online groups for exchange of women, start um, a, something like a, a local hotline, a local ombudswoman that people can turn to. Um, you have it in your hand to make the, the theme less of a taboo and to, have, to help ladies that are encountering it. I saw in the comments there is water shortage and public clinics have closed. Sure, that is, that is a theme, and particularly water shortage in the global south, when ladies have to walk longer ways to the, to the wells and sometimes can't even leave the home or, or have difficulties of being attacked while walking to water uh, sources. This is a massive theme. Yet there are communities that handle it really well by women managing to take care of the children and going together which sort of reduces the risk of being attacked during walking for water. But yet we are talking about you need to connect via mobile phone and how can you do that if you're living or if you're barely surviving day by day. Um, underpayment, I think it's to all of us who are bosses in one way or the other to look at paying equally and paying men and women in a fair and transparent way. And when it comes to, when it comes to the crisis per se, I'm not an advocate of let only ladies lead. I'm an advocate of let's lead in community, let's lead in collaboration, and let's use the feminine traits that we have of empathy, creativity, and collaboration to tackle it in the future even better than we did in the past. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica, for your input. I think we did a really great job at um, not only covering different sectors, but also different parts of the world and different spheres of influence. Um, I will now try to um, look over your questions and uh, with the help of my colleague, and if that's okay with everyone, start from the top and then just go through them one by one. I mean, the timekeeping is really perfect. We even have two minutes more than planned, so thank you so much. Okay, um, so we started with Katharina's talk, um, and someone said, um, two full-time jobs, does that automatically mean the people don't have children or was this just a coincidence in the data set? Yes, just was. a very specific yes, follow-up. 
Yes, it was. <laughs> it Thank was those, those couples um, without children that were working both full time. That was just coincidence. But also it is something that we usually find in Austria as well, um, that without children, women and men do work full time and then they tend to specialize in paid and unpaid work. And um, we have one of the highest um, part time rates. Um, so. Thank you. And the next question was also addressed to you, which would be, um, Katharina, did you control for age in this analysis of children versus no children? Because um, the person thinks that younger couples have fewer children, but, my, my, but might also show more equitable divisions in work than older generations. So um, what, how did age come in? Um, yes, we did. And um, <clears throat> the interesting thing for us was that once again, and we've seen that in other studies as well, is that it's not so much about the age of couples, but the fact that there is a child or there is none. So um, children in Austria, and we are very specific within um, in, in Europe, we're very similar to Germany, but other than that, we're very specific in our norms and um, yeah, values, and we value a good mother <laughs> more than anything else, and we have a very specific um, um, picture of her, and um, she's taking care of her child or her children, um, and so this, this I, I suppose, socialization and, um, yeah, and, and the education that we get is way more um, way more important in sharpening um, gender roles um, within couples than the age of the couple. So that yeah, so you would say that. patriarchal <laughs> norms kind of trump um, the age questions. Okay. Um, another question would be a very practical one. Would you be willing to share your slides somehow? Of course, of course. I have no no idea how to do that. I mean, within <laughs> we will figure it out. I think um, I have no exact idea. If I think you can't really share slides here, but uh, we will we will find a way. Thank you so much. Um, one last question to Katharina. Um, are women going more into self-entrepreneurship? What is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic women's mental, on women's mental health uh, quali qualitatively and quantitatively? So two questions, actually. So um, are there more women going into um, self-entrepreneurship and um, what is the impact of mental health? I think we covered the last question. Yeah, um, I think we did. And the um, uh, South um, within with uh, or due to the crisis or before the crisis, because we, we see them, well, the self-employed people very much affected by this crisis, especially the women, because it's, um, it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's these um, typically women, female jobs that are affected because you can't, well, tourism is affected. Um, it's your hair cutter that is affected. Um, mm -hmm. So we have these like typically female jobs that are so much, um, so much more affected than the typical male jobs, and um, especially the ones that um, are self-employed have really no safety net at all because um, they can't fall back on any um, insurances really. So that's at the moment very hard in Austria and it's probably too early to tell if they started their own businesses as a response to the crisis right like there's probably no data on no that. data there now yeah. okay um so now we're shifting to questions to uh, Mireille one question would be do you think Mireille that law can be uh, can help to improve the situation for women in less privileged areas like for example the idea would be compulsory education until the age of maybe 16 um do you, do you think the law can change the situation, the, the difficult situation you also addressed? Yes, absolutely, and I think that uh, that that's the thing we have to do. That that uh, in uh, as well, in the, the politics have uh, to put um, have has to, to to change it. That that's the only way we have. That's probably one of the biggest misconceptions, right? That yes. everything is your own fault. Something just needs to be done by yeah, no. politics and regulators. Mm -hmm. And then there's another very interesting point, I think. Um, someone said your example of using the um, example of a surgery is a very extreme case, as some treatments just take very, very long to um, 
to perform right in the hospital, uh, let's say a heart transplant of several hours. Is this parents unfriendly situation the same in other branches of medicine? And someone said, uh, I don't have a medical background, but please. Yes, tell me so. yes. Uh, uh, it is not only the surgery. Yes, it's true that the surgery is one of the top uh, um, uh, field in the in the medicine. And we, we have also long hours and it's a hand. Uh, it's a hand field, so you have really, you have to stay longer. You have to learn it uh, until you can really operate very properly. But still, th there are also other med uh, field, uh, medicine fields where, which are um, not really, uh, um, who doesn't provide the environment for women to work there. And most of uh, most uh, medical fields in the medical fields, women work part time. Yeah, mm -hmm. as so most of my friends that I know who are who are doctors and who are internists uh, or um, working, yeah, in different departments are working half as so are working half times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is which then again nobody thinks about that, but which then no. again affects their pensions, right? And yes. is, so that's yes. the problem because Katharina yeah. is and so we, the we wealth really, gap, and so but, it's, yeah. it's 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 really up to. Uh, Oh, as a one um, in politics and also in the medical field that we open the doors with women and that we yeah. we make as a, we provide an environment that women can also have children and work full time that has to be possible yeah mm -hmm. yeah that makes a lot of sense uh, Monica, we had a question coming up um, based on a comment you made um, in passing why do teenage pregnancies in increase during a crisis Unfortunately, not only domestic violence, but sexual abuse increases in crisis. And uh, as I mentioned before, statistics after the crisis that happened with Ebola, SARS, MERS, uh, Zik, uh, they all proved that nine months later, after the heightened time of the actual pandemic, teenage pregnancies were registered many more times than um, I don't have the accurate figures from the from the states in Africa, but that is the answer that unfortunately is is even evidenced by data. And also probably access to contraception, right? Um, might that, also is the other, that is the other side of the coin. So many, many are hesitant the moment a crisis is happening, a pandemic is happening to even go to clinics and contraception is more difficult to get hold of. Uh, and money in crisis situation when employment is also scarce is spent mm -hmm. elsewhere. And so there are a multitude of factors, um, including, unfortunately, the, the sexual abuse, but also contraceptives that are more difficult mm -hmm. to reach. Yes. Uh, one more question for Monica and then one uh, closing question for all three of you, because it came up multiple times and I think it would be a great way of rounding up this only female uh, panel. Uh, so last question for uh, Monica. What do you think, uh, what happens if female leadership goes wrong and turns into toxic leadership? Um, because that's especially probably um, yeah, difficult to accept. What do you make of toxic female leadership? Yeah, um, there is toxic leadership independent of gender and unfortunately it happens everywhere. Yet I think we do have to allow also female leaders occasionally to fail because we we do have a culture of non-failure in at least the west where we are not admitting to any mistake that we have ever made and i think toxic means that you always have to be right toxic means that you're pushing your opinion above and beyond all the others mm. and i think the that women Sometimes there's even this quote saying, whatever women do, they must do twice as well as men. Mm. And fortunately, um, this is not so difficult. It's a quote by a feminist. And, and she, it, it is true that, yes, when women are taking leadership roles, they are becoming even more masculine sometimes than, the, than men are, just to prove their point and just because they made it in the ranks. But my plea would be for allowing for failure and allowing for failure for women as much as for men, mm -hmm. um, the moment there is reflection and the moment there is, um, there is not the, the kind of Trump, I'd say, yeah. I'm sorry to point them out, but the Trump or, or even, and I'm pointing to many now, Erdogan, Orban, Bolsonaro kind of attitude of my country first, my nation first, um, anti-collaboration. So the moment we have got this masculine uh, mindset, and I'm sorry to brand it as that because I don't see it in women yet. Um, 
then we are talking about toxicity. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Let me already thank you for participating in this really enlightening panel. Maybe one in one sentence, how would you describe the role of men in this process? We have like one minute left. What would you say? What do you expect from men? Because that question came up multiple times. Maybe Mireille was uh, formulating an answer. Uh, yes, I think that men um, have, to, as we have to work together as society, men and women side by side uh, for, um, to, to, for, for, for the change. That makes a lot of sense. Anything to add to that, Katarina, Monica? Well, well, be active fathers. I mean, you're, you're setting an example for future generations, for your daughters and your, your sons. So, I guess that's... Yes. Any final, any final statement to add, Monica? Men are half of our humankind and hence it has to be in collaboration between men and women hand hand. that we achieve what we want to achieve. Really, yeah, Mireille, it's hand in hand. It's mm. us together. Mm. And Thanks. the daughters will be proud of their fathers and mothers will be proud of their sons mm. if men are stepping up the game yes. with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, maybe we can do the online clap. Yeah. Thank you so much for a really interesting discussion. I'm so sorry we couldn't take all the questions. And I think we'll soon be kicked out of this space. Um, I don't know, we've already, we're already at half past seven. Thank you so much. Um, and have, an, have a great Forum Alpach 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.